Thank you very much, Karen, and thank you all for joining us uh, physically and virtually. Actually, I'm very excited to stand up here and um, in front of a real audience. It's been a long time and I missed it a lot. So thank you everybody, everybody for coming on. Uh, the coronavirus taught us a, a very uh, important lesson. Taught us that the world is one. No borders, no countries, no continents. As well as a very important uh, lesson on the vulnerable group. Among them, the aging. So Tel Aviv University, as Karen said, uh, announced this year the healthy aging as one of its top priorities. And that is very important and very timely, uh, not only for the corona, but in, in the broadband. Uh, it is my, my great honor and privilege to invite Professor Sarah Harper the fellow of the Royal Anthropological Institute, a commander of the Order of the British Empire, co-professor of gerontology, founder and director of the Institute of Population Aging at the University of Oxford. We invite her to frame the problem and challenges of aging. This time, an online uh, speaker unfortunately, hope that, we'll that she will join us uh, soon in Israel. Sarah is a renowned Europe and world uh, leader and pioneer in the aging research across a broad range of scientific, academic, and government aspects. Sarah chaired the recent UK government review on aging and served on the UK Prime Minister Council for science and technology, advising um, and uh, on demo demography. We were blessed to have Sarah speak in our first healthy aging lecture, and on the second meeting, she was already virtual. Uh, so those two uh, conferences were 2018 and 2019, and we had to wait till today to go on with this very important uh, session. So please welcome uh, Sarah, uh, and welcome here again, Sarah, the floor is you. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you, Mira, for your introduction. And thank you very much for the, the committee um, inviting me to speak to you. Um, I'm now going to share my screen but the host has disabled participant screen sharing. So can someone please allow me to share my screen, please? You have to um, do something, otherwise I can't share my slides. Um, I still can't share. Okay. <laughs> can someone tell me if I'm going to be allowed to share or whether I should just try and talk you through without slides, which is a little difficult because I've Sarah, we're working on we're working on opening it now. Thank you. Okay, so uh, if just a little bit of um, introduction. Uh, as Mira said, I work in predominantly demography, and I work in societal aging. Uh, and one of the wonderful things that's happened, I think, in the 30 years that I've been working in gerontology, is this interaction between social and biological and medical scientists. Uh, and one of the first slides I'm going to show you is that we really, really, over the last five years in particular, have come to understand the importance of what I would say is cell and society. And we now understand that the things we do as individuals uh, have a real impact on our bodies at the cellular level, uh, and we can increase our chances of healthy life expectancy uh, by living healthy lives, and that can really affect us at the cellular level. And now I can share, wonderful. Okay, let me start this share screen. Okay, perfect. Okay, wonderful. So hopefully you can see this now, frame the challenges of population aging. 
I think there are three defining questions that we all have to ask, and I'm going to be talking predominantly from the population and policy uh, angle. As Mira said, I, I've done a lot of uh, policy work. So I think we need to know, will increases in life expectancy continue? Will advances in life expectancy be matched by advances in healthy life expectancy? Probably one of the most important questions. And this third one, even with advances in healthy life expectancy, will increases in the pure numbers of older adults increase morbidity within our population? What do we know? I'm just going to take you through a few things. This is really what I was talking about whilst we were waiting for the screen uh, share. We know aging is malleable, and we know that healthy behaviors can prevent chronic conditions and slow down functional decline. Um, I love this picture. It comes from uh, one of my colleagues. I have a guest professorship at the University of Copenhagen, and Professor Rasmussen um, actually designed this slide. Uh, we know on the one side that actual stresses such as retirement, bereavement, and disease, which manifest themselves during major life course transitions, actually impact upon us at the cellular level. But we also know that there are resilience factors, uh, diet, exercise, social networks, etc., and they can protect us. And as I say, I think that advance is something that has really changed our understanding of healthy uh, life uh, uh, expectancy. I'll just get to this there. Um, we know there are differences between generations, a huge cohort effects. Um, I'll talk a little bit about this at the end when I talk about the importance of data. And within generations, and um, that is socioeconomic effects, and that this becomes more pronounced as we age. And one of the really key things that will run through this talk, and hopefully run through the other social science talks, is inequality. We really understand the impact of inequality. We understand that many of the risk factors are mutually reinforcing, and they multiply over the life course. And a life course approach, I think, is really important. And then this one, which already we talked about in the introduction, an aging population requires multidisciplinary evidence and integrated systems, that we really do need the science to come together, but we also need integrated systems of delivery. Let's look at some life expectancy. Um, I did, we, we prepared these slides, and I think there's a very interesting story. And remember, this is at the population level. And what we're doing is life expectancy at 60. And here we're comparing Northwest Europe with Israel. Now we know that Israel has a far higher life expectancy than Russia and Eastern Europe. But we were very surprised when we did this at the high life expectancy of Israeli women and men. The women are in the hard lines, the men are in the dotty lines. And Israel, we've put in a big thick red so that you can all see it. And you can see that Israeli women at age 60 consistently across this century have had one of the highest life expectancies compared with Northwest Europe and men as well. In actual fact, they are much, much clearer, nearer to the Mediterranean society. And that, I think, is a really interesting lesson at the population level. In other words, given that many of these men and women will have actually grown up and been born and come from Eastern European countries in particular. And yet, when they came to this Mediterranean-based country where the diet and the lifestyle is very Mediterranean, Israel very much fits into that Mediterranean scene. And particularly men, if you look at the red dotted line, men in particular have some of the highest life expectancy age 60 of any Mediterranean country. And that tells us that we really do understand at the population level how to extend life expectancy, diet, exercise, well-being, etc. What about the future? We have a lot of research on what's going to happen to future life expectancy, and I'm just going to very quickly show you this one study. This came out in The Lancet in 2017. Uh, it was looked at probabilistic uh, uh, modeling of WHO, and if we zoom in, we can see that by 2030, this study predicts that South Korean women will have a life expectancy at birth of over 90. And that is quite extraordinary. Half the population that will be born in Korea within the next 10 years will make it to 90. And you can see France, Japan, Spain, uh, Israel isn't in this study, particularly that Mediterranean uh, dominance. Lots and lots of other studies are suggesting that despite variations, we think life expectancy is going to continue to grow in this way. But what about inequalities? Um, 
We do know that there is inequality in mortality. This is a study that we did in Oxford, and we had access to 2.5 million occupational pension records from the UK. What is really important is these are occupational pension records. We know that there is huge variations in mortality among the very rich and the very poor, but we've taken the very poor out of this. These are people who are in firm salaried occupations, and we were very surprised at the differential that there was in mortality. Very quickly to show you, here we have a UK life expectancy for men from age 65. And if we look at our bottom 20% and our top 20%, there is a 10 year difference in life expectancy at age 65 among this already selected group that are in salaried employment. So much so that when we look at the proportion of 65 year old men expected to survive to each age, Therefore, comparing our top 20% in blue and our bottom 20% in green, by the time you get to your mid-80s, there is a 50% probability of yes or no uh, reaching the next year. We then were able to look at the impact of different factors on longevity. And if we just look at the bottom two bars, we have our manual employee, our poor 20% at the top, 12 years uh, life at age 65. But... 3.2 if it retired in normal health and 4.1 if it had a healthy lifestyle. So seven of those uh, lost years is to do with health. Health across the life course is so important at the population level. What about healthy life expectancy? Um, everywhere there is a health gap. Uh, here we've just looked at Israeli women age 60 and we're comparing uh, the life expectancy with the healthy life years. So the dark blue is life expectancy and the healthy life years is the dotted. And we can see as in many countries, it's six to seven years gap. Uh, we can compare that here, we've got the UK and this is actually at age 80. Uh, and if you look at the orange, uh, that is the UK figures. And you can see that actually we have one of the better health gaps. That's because our life expectancy is slightly lower than France and Spain, which are the dark and the light blue. Uh, but still, even though we actually stay healthier longer in the UK at the moment, we still have roughly a six year gap uh, in the end of our lives. And this, this is something uh, we did for the government. And this I think is one of the most striking studies. This is comparing life expectancy and healthy life expectancy in England and Wales by areas of deprivation. We have the most deprived on one side and the least deprived or the most affluent on the other. And we're comparing life expectancy in dark green with healthy life expectancy in pale green. And the way to understand this is that if you are a 65 year old man living in the UK in one of our most deprived areas, then you will probably make it to 80, but all of your 70s will be in ill health. If you're living in one of the more affluent areas, then you'll probably make it into your late 80s and you won't even go into ill health until you reach 80. So healthy life expectancy and inequality and poverty, very, very much linked. What has changed? I'm not going to spend too much time on this because I know you have a fascinating talk right at the end by uh, Professor Sir Michael Marmont, who's going to be talking about COVID. But there has been so much that has come out on COVID. Uh, and life expectancy. A lot of it, uh, very early stuff and really not particularly good. Um, you'll be able to look at these slides later. So I've just given you some uh, very good references. I'm not gonna go into detail, but let's look at some of the key lessons that we already know. For men and particularly uh, around ethnicity, uh, we know that there was a decrease in US life expectancy of 1.67 years over the last 18 months. And that's a reversion of 14 years in historical, in historical life expectancy gains. And particularly it affected black men living in the States. Uh, so much so it was the lowest level since 1998, uh, down to 67.7 years. And all that progress that had been made over the last decade in reducing the gap in life expectancy in the US between black and white people was erased uh, in just those 18 months. We also, know a lot about life expectancy, COVID and women. Um, this is just some public health figures on England. Um, we are looking here at male and female. Uh, you can see 1.3 years drop in general. But if you look extraordinary, look at the orange lines. You can see very clearly that women's life expectancy is much higher than male life expectancy. 
but you can see the dramatic drop that happened, particularly on that orange line. Uh, you can really see the drop in life expectancy that we uh, experienced. So much so, we've learned a lot about gender, but to a certain extent, uh, what it has done is reaffirmed what we already knew. Women in general have a five-year advantage over men in terms of risk. At every age, they have a lower risk of morbidity and death, even if they have a chronic disease. Across the globe, men lost nearly 50% more years than women, and women generally were older at COVID death than men, 71 for men and 76 for women. So what lessons have we learned? Um, high, although we know what the decrease in life expectancy has been, we also know going forward that the high prevalence of COVID-19 has a negative impact upon most of the systems. Uh, and that isn't just high mortality rates from the virus, but also from other diseases. I think Michael Mumma will talk a little bit about this. Remember that for when we look actually at the graph I'm going to show you in a minute. We also know there's something called long COVID. Uh, and as I say at the end, you're going to have a talk about the impact of long COVID on healthy life expectancy. But we do expect it to have some kind of an impact. But well, we have learned some interesting lessons. Um, our knowledge has improved significantly around morbidity by various characteristics. We really understand the role of gender and ethnicity in a way that we didn't before. Uh, and we also, I think, will have a huge impact in our understanding around the immune system response and immunization and chronic disease. And I think we'll look back to 2020, 2021 and see a real step forward. We already know that with the new vaccinations, we have the mRNA, which have really had a boost. And I think that we will look back and see that actually we learned so much about our immune systems and the use of vaccination. And this, for those of us who've been going on and on about obesity and obesity impacting upon life expectancy and healthy life expectancy, just one slide. Um, higher BMI was associated with COVID-19 and deaths from COVID-19 um, across uh, uh, all the spectrum. Obesity kills us, uh, and it isn't just COVID, but this has been a really wake-up call, I think, to many of the public. So here we have life expectancy at birth in England and Wales, um, and this is across uh, from 1841 to 2011. And I just want you to focus um, here. Uh, we have, um, obviously, what was happening in the First World War and the flu epidemic. This is what happened in England and Wales uh, in uh, the Second World War. But look how quickly we rebounded. And the really important question is, are we going to do this over basically probably the next four or five years? Are we going to rebound? Because remember, up here, so much now has come from medical intervention. And as I said, our healthcare systems have really had a shock in many high income countries. Um, and as a consequence, we believe that probably the recovery V is going to be much more at that angle as our health systems cope with all those knock-on effects that they weren't able to treat, uh, and also the buildup of chronic diseases that we had more or less got rid of uh, over the last few years. So we will rebound, but it may take longer. But what about this question? And this, I think, is really important. Even with advances in healthy life expectancy, will increases in the numbers of older adults increase morbidity within the population? I'm just going to show you three very quick graphs. Again, you can look at them in more detail when you have the slides. So this is um, something that was published uh, earlier this year. This is using um, UK data. And this is the estimated numbers of people with dementia by age. And if you take a look at this dark blue line here, these basically are people over 70. And you can see that although the number of cases is going to decline in our 70s because we know that age-specific prevalence and incidence is likely to decrease, and I'm sure the dementia people will be talking about that. Sheer numbers in the increase of those people who are living mean we will actually have more dementia within our populations. Um, this very much shows it here. We have um, uh, older numbers of people with a disability. Here we have cases. Here we have prevalence. And you can see even if the prevalence, this is men and this is women, women tend to be a higher uh, in uh, ADLs, even if that flattens or even falls, just because of sheer numbers, the cases is going to go up. And going back to the inequality story, um, this is, I think, a really, really striking graph published in The Lancet. Um, this looks at crude incidents of heart failure. 
And at the bottom, um, we have the least deprived uh, in England and Wales. And at the top, we have the most deprived. And you can see that if we could reduce uh, our uh, health, um, sorry, reduce the risk in our population due to conquering inequality, we would dramatically reduce, uh, they say here, 18% in incidence of heart failure. So, so far, everything that I've spoken about um, has been about traditional medicine, healthy living, disease prevention, and cure. And the key question that we've been looking at over the last 20 years or so is how much life expectancy can we expect to gain without the intensive application of scientific medicine? And we've estimated the impact of life expectancy on delaying the onset of what we believe to be age-related diseases rather than eliminating them altogether. Though I know age-related disease is something that's contested and you're going to be talking about. What about this? This is what we're really moving into, um, regenerative medicine and age retardation. And the key question for demographers is how much life expectancy can we expect to gain with the intensive application of scientific medicine? This obviously is the future. And even over the last five years, we have seen a tremendous increase in things like stem cell biology, 3D printing, personalized medicine, and new genetics. And of course, this, our understanding of cell senescence. Uh, I have to thank my colleague at Oxford, Lynn Cox, uh, for this slide. Um, I do not particularly work on this, uh, but I have had a lot of interactions with her. And I think as demographers, we really have to understand the kind of science that is occurring around cell senescence, because that probably is where the future in terms of both life expectancy and healthy uh, life expectancy uh, will be. So to conclude, what is the policy challenge? I think those of us interested in policy, it is to facilitate health and well-being across individual life courses, while at the same time reducing inequalities both within generations and importantly, between generations as the population ages. And that is something that I think our social scientists are becoming increasingly aware of, that we have to make sure that resources go to older adults, but not at the expense of younger adults. And I just want to finish on this. Many of you heard me talk about this uh, in uh, one of the virtual. Uh, this was the Anglo-Israeli colloquium, colloquium, which was held in November 2019, and it was policymakers, academics, scholars, uh, we had Jewish, Arab, Israeli, Palestinians, and British together uh, for three days. And subsequently, over the last year, or couple of years, actually, uh, we have been working on something called the Jerusalem Declaration. It has now been published, and I'm delighted it has been published in Hebrew, uh, in gerontology and geriatrics, uh, and in English and Arabic in the Journal of Population Aging. The Declaration, I think, sets the real scene for what we as societies have to do. Um, and in the last three or four minutes, I'm going to really quickly whip through this. Uh, but again, you'll have time to read it when you see the slides. We looked at 10 things. And let's just take a taster of what we said. Aging in the wider context. Population aging does not occur in a vacuum. And we have to take into account that it's influenced by and in turn influences other global trends. Climate change, pandemics, they're all linked. Aging, popula uh, aging policies Population aging requires a life course approach to policy making. What about data and indicators? And I've given this in full because we spend so much time on this. Our indicators must be sensitive to cohort changes in the aging process. And we believe that actually, if we extrapolate physical and cognitive performance from cohort to cohort without taking that into account, we can seriously compromise the validity of chronological age as a marker of capacity or performance. And one of the things we call for are large scale longitudinal cohort comparative surveys covering central domains of human functioning. Work, uh, we must retain older people if they wish in the labor force, but in order to do that, we need training and we need far higher standards for the design of working environments and working practices. We looked at health uh, and again, just a few notes on this. Um, we must decrease the gap between life expectancy and healthy or disability-free life expectancy. We need to combine the prevention of disease and disability with treatment for ill health. And we must expand, expand health-related resources across the life course. 
and we all felt that the status of geriatric medicine and geriatric psychiatry must be raised to attract highly qualified young practitioners. In terms of care, we call for a caring economy. In terms of financial security, we want economic dignity in old age. We believe that end of life really has to be examined and that we have to have palliative care which has the choice on when not to prolong life as well as to support that end of life. And really running through this was a general awareness of ageism. We need a proactive policy approach, raising public awareness, educational programs in combating ageism. Otherwise, nothing is going to change. And finally, we argue for participatory co-design and co-creation. We want older adults to have more choice and control in how they live their lives. And, and you can get the full Jerusalem Declaration uh, uh, on um, our, web, our website, uh, as well as in those journals. So I'm going to stop now. Um, that has been a very, very uh, quick uh, rush through um, what I think is important uh, for framing uh, the challenge and if you notice, I don't call it a problem, I call it a challenge. So hopefully uh, uh, we will be able to pick on many of those themes in the conference to come. And, and thank you very much, Karen and colleagues, for inviting me and for such a stimulating programme. Thank you. Um.